you have to understand this first. You gotta remember the um, the neuron, right? Mm -hmm. The neuron is uh, conducting impulses from the soma cell body away through the axon. The axon's covered by these little sheets of fat that we call the myelin sheath. Okay? And in order for you guys to know the degenerative disorders, I need you guys to really understand this anatomy. If you guys understand the anatomy, it becomes a lot easier for you to understand what's going on with the disorders. So, uh, like I discussed yesterday, this is like your iPhone charger cable. The white covering outside is the myelin sheath. It's a protective sheet that allows for the impulses to be insulated so they can be conducted faster, right? Inside that white covering of the, of the phone charger, you have the wires. That's what the axon is inside, okay? So the impulse goes this way. It receives it from other neurons through the dendrites, and it goes this way, right? This location right here is known as the axon terminal. Like the terminal at the airport, they're about to take off, right? So you have these little globules of fluid called vesicles, and when the electrical impulse stimulates them, they open up and they release their respective neurotransmitter. Right now, the neurotransmitter that I want you guys to know is something called acetylcholine. Okay? And then you have the target tissue. For this particular case, it's gonna be the muscles. These little lines I'm drawing are known as the receptor sites. So the neuron is the pitcher. The neurotransmitter acetylcholine is the ball. And the receptor sites are the catchers. So all those three elements must be intact in order for the signals to pass through the synaptic cleft, the space right here, and so it can stimulate the muscles to do their thing, so they can contract. Every time you have a movement, your body releases a significant amount of acetylcholine. But if all you're doing is a small movement like this, do you need all that acetylcholine? And your body is very fiscally conservative. So imagine this, this is an enzyme that comes in here and any of the acetylcholine that your body doesn't need for that movement, it'll recycle it. And this is known as cholinesterase. So let's recap, I know it's a lot, I get it. You have to have the myelin sheath intact so it can insulate the axon, so it can conduct its electrical impulse. It reaches the um, axon terminal, the acetylcholine, the neurotransmitters are released, they get to the docking sites, the receptors, and then the muscle contracts. Whenever you have an excessive amount of acetylcholine, you have your cholinesterase that comes in and it recycles it. Does that make sense? This is what happens in every movement that we partake in. We have different conditions though that alter this type, that, that become affected when your immunological response alters the anatomical structures. Let me explain. You guys probably have heard of something called myasthenia gravis. And thenia means, by the way, thenia means sensation. In myasthenia gravis, this condition, it's an autoimmune issue that destroys your receptor sites. Not all of them, but a lot of them, right? It destroys them. Now, we need the receptor site so we can catch the neurotransmitter so it can conduct its impulse so we can have muscle contraction, correct? That's what's supposed to happen. But in this condition, it's autoimmune, they're destroying your, your receptor sites. And so what happens? What's gonna be the main manifestation for these patients? Understanding that acetylcholine allows you to move, have muscle contractions. Your receptor sites are being destroyed. What's the, what are you gonna see? Stiffness. Stiffness, okay. Mobility. Now we're talking about something. Yeah, you're gonna have a lack of movement. You're gonna have weakness. Okay, you're gonna have weakness for this one. It's not stiffness. Stiffness means that the muscle is um, atrophied or something that's contracted. No, no, no. I'm talking about the relaying of information for muscle contraction. There's gonna be weakness. There's gonna be you're gonna have an inability to move how you want to. Does that make sense? That's myasthenia gravis. We have another condition known as multiple sclerosis. In multiple sclerosis, it's also an autoimmune issue. It happens more to women. It happens more to women than men. Okay, it happens to them relatively young in their 20s, 30s. And 
there's demyelination of the myelin sheath. What that means is that these insulated components that are supposed to allow for the electrical conduction to pass on through just fine, they're being destroyed. And if they're being destroyed, they're exposing the axon, and now there's gonna be, what happens to your cell phone chargers, guys, when you've had them for a couple of months now, because they're so cheaply made? Do they charge your phone how they're supposed to? What do you have to do? You gotta wiggle that motherfucker, right? You gotta wiggle it. So that's the problem here. You have abnormal conduction, and it's gonna be very similar manifestations, but you're also gonna have a lot of sensory impairments. The patient's gonna have like tinnitus, they're gonna have visual issues, and as both of these progress, they get worse and worse, and eventually they affect your respiratory centers, your ab ability to swallow, deglutition is affected, your ability to breathe, your ability to expectorate. Does that make sense, guys? In a nutshell, that's what's happening with these two conditions. Let me explain these two, because there's another one that's a little bit different. In both of these, how do you distinguish? Is this myasthenia gravis? Is this multiple sclerosis? There's a test that we can um, perform. It's called a Tensilon test. And so the Tensilon test, it's a small dose. You guys remember this one, cholinesterase? Mm -hmm. How it's supposed to recycle the acetylcholine so we won't waste it. But if you have myasthenia gravis, where your receptor sites are destroyed, do you want to remove that acetylcholine or do you want to leave it there so it can eventually get to the, the receptor sites that are working? Leave it. You want to leave it there, right? So what do you want to do with this? Since this recycles it, what do you want to do with this? Block it. You want to block it. So what we do is we give something called anti-cholinesterase. Okay, if it ends in stigmine, it's anti-cholinesterase, right? And so you give them, the patient comes in and they tell you, hey, I have this weakness when I'm moving around and whatnot. So they give them a small injection of anticholinesterase, the stigmines. What, should, uh, what that does is it blocks the reabsorption of the acetylcholine and it leaves it there. So it can eventually make its way, trickle down to the receptor site so you can move better. So what's that medication going to do? What's gonna happen to the movement? It's gonna start moving. It's gonna start moving. The movement will improve, but it's very short term. It's like for five minutes and then they're back to how they were. But that's how we know this patient that came in with these manifestations, they don't have multiple sclerosis. They have myasthenia gravis. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different tests, blood tests that we assess for, that assess for, um, for autoimmune properties that are normally gonna be present. But that's how you start narrowing it down. It becomes a lot more difficult, okay? Both of these conditions are immunologically related, so we give interferons, that's what we call them, interferons. Or interferons. And those are medications that slow down your immune system from destroying those tissues. The problem is, this is a chronic issue, it's degenerative, it continues to get worse. And the goal is for us to limit exacerbations because this patient right here will have moments, episodes of exacerbation and remission. And the more stressed out their body becomes, the more likelihood they have of an exacerbation. You guys understand that stressful situations in the body alter your immunological response, especially for these guys. So you wanna promote rest, you wanna promote good nutrition, you wanna promote everything that's, that we read about that's good for us, that's what you wanna promote for these people. Um, and you wanna decrease the likelihood of exacerbations, okay? These people are gonna also have sensory uh, deficits, motor deficits, keep in mind that deglutition, swallowing becomes impaired, now you have to look out for aspiration potential, breathing issues, does that make sense with this? The third one I wanna talk about is very similar to these, but this one's unique because I think we spoke about it yesterday briefly. It's called Guillain-Barre syndrome, GBS. And this is also demyelination, but it happens in an acute fashion. And it's not progressive to the point where you're gonna to continue to have it. It happens, if you survive it, then you get better. And this one, we have Federico right here. Imagine Federico gets some type of situation where their immune system is activated and then it starts behaving abnormally. It could be a vaccine. It could be, what were you saying yesterday? The person, the toe cut, that the person got their toe. Yeah, it could be usually a bacterial viral infection, but notice the theme here, anything that stimulates the immune system, then the immune system overreacts and it behaves not how we want it to. 
And so we, the, your immune system starts destroying all your myelin sheath from your feet upwards. So this one is, um, this particular condition, it's an ascending paralysis, which is very different from the other conditions that we just discussed. An ascending paralysis is a very unique manifestation that is not shared with multiple sclerosis and myasthenia gravis because those both are systemic all over the body. They usually start affecting your fingers first, your hearing ability, and then little by little goes more towards the center. But my point is in this one, you have ascending paralysis. It could also be triggered by a vaccine. I had patients when I worked in, in DOU that they came in because of, react one of them came in with a reaction to this to a vaccine. Not to say that vaccines are bad, but again, anything that stimulates your immune system may cause it to behave abnormally, and this is what happens. Your biggest concern is the progression of this condition because it happens from a few hours to a couple days. And if you are in a, a place where no one's around you and this is happening to you, the problem is once that paralysis gets to your thoracic cavity, and all this is paralyzed, once it hits you here, now you're screwed because you can't breathe. And if you can't move for attention, the patient's gonna die. So your biggest concern with this patient is also your airway. And the patient will need to be intubated so they can, um, so they can survive the progression of the illness, which usually lasts for, uh, uh, for several days to a couple weeks, and then it subsides and the patient usually recovers. Now, that's what the book says. There's some cases where they don't recover fully, but nonetheless, it is something that could happen. The patient gets better. Does that make sense, guys? What's your concern? You gotta, you gotta ask yourself, what's my role? What's my role as a nurse? Safety, education. So you wanna instill interventions that, that promote safety for the patient. You wanna decrease heat for a lot of activity, especially with these patients, because the heat speeds up metabolism, which stresses the body out, which may lead to an exacerbation of the multiple sclerosis. Does that make sense? Yes. Any questions on this so far? All right, that's good.